These days, the Internet contains eye cancer reference books, images, and even pathology analysis of ocular tumors and orbital diseases. So today I plan to share with you new, interesting, and essential concepts in ophthalmic oncology. Note that this work will include my work, others' work, multi-center international cooperative studies, and analysis of all. Most importantly, this presentation was created to give you the tools to become better ophthalmologists and eye cancer specialists. Now let's look inside the eye. Our next subject is choroidal melanoma, current concepts. Let's touch on diagnosis of small choroidal melanomas. When should I refer a choroidal nevus? New choroidal melanoma treatments, and the latest on treatment of radiation retinopathy. It's not too difficult to tell when you see a medium sized or large choroidal melanoma. However, it's those atypical choroidal nevi, which are actually small choroidal melanomas, that can be difficult to diagnose. I developed a mnemonic to help differentiate choroidal nevi from melanomas. The mnemonic is called MOST, where melanoma equals orange pigment, subretinal fluid, and thickness of two or more millimeters. On the top left, you see gross orange pigment. It's not hard to see that with indirect ophthalmoscopy and color imaging. However, on the top right, you can see that fundus autofluorescent imaging highlights and hyperautofluoresces the orange pigment. When you have small amounts of orange pigment, sometimes the fundus autofluorescent images will help you find and, and diagnose its presence. Subretinal fluid is a very important indication that the tumor is likely a small choroidal melanoma. You see on the upper left and upper right slides, clinically, serous fluid can be visualized. However, on the lower left, you see the OCT, which is the best way to find small amounts of subretinal fluid. T is the last letter of most. T stands for thickness. Typically, two or more millimeters is considered to be a risk factor that a nevus is likely a melanoma. A scan was used classically to measure the anterior posterior thickness of melanomas. However, currently, and especially for small lesions, B scan can be easier. So there you have it. My mnemonic is most melanoma equals orange pigment, subretinal fluid, and thickness. Orange pigment best seen with fundus autofluorescent imaging. Subretinal fluid best seen with OCT imaging. And thickness best measured by ophthalmic ultrasonography. When I was invited to give the Ellsworth Lecture at Cornell, I thought I'd do something unusual. So I sat down and wrote all of the findings associated with the five most common choroidal tumors. That was the subject of my lecture on multimodality imaging. It's posted on my YouTube channel if you'd like to watch. But for now, let's concentrate on this slide from that lecture. Here we see there are a lot of characteristics of choroidal melanoma. But what I did with most is I boiled it down to the three most important characteristics that most all ophthalmic oncologists would agree are associated with the diagnosis of choroidal melanoma when they're seen together. And as I mentioned, they include orange pigment, subretinal fluid, and thickness more than two millimeters. So that brings us to our second subject. When should I refer a choroidal nevus to an eye cancer specialist? Well, as you see, a choroidal nevus is suspicious if it has orange pigment, subretinal fluid, or thickness, and definitely growth. However, a number of patients are sent just for baseline evaluation measurements using photography, OCT, fluorescein, and ultrasound as needed. Once documented, the patient can go back to the referring doctor for periodic monitoring. 
A lot of people ask me, what should I do with a newly discovered benign-looking choroidal nevus? Well, I tell them, at a minimum, take a fundus photograph. You have to establish a baseline. Then I suggest that you see that patient back in 8 to 10 weeks for comparison before transitioning to once or twice yearly comparative visits. This is because rarely a completely benign appearing choroidal nevus may wind up being a diffuse choroidal melanoma. This is such a case. On the top left, you see a benign appearing choroidal nevus. On the top right, you see fundus autofluorescent imaging showing no evidence of orange pigment lipofuscin. On the bottom left, you see a fluorescein angiogram, later stage, which shows no intrinsic vascularity with leakage. And on the bottom right, you see a three-dimensional reconstruction of the OCT image, which shows no subretinal or intraretinal fluid when the entire volume is examined. One might wonder why all this testing was done for a benign appearing choroidal nevus. However, it was sent to me by a trusted retinal specialist because he felt that it had grown. Just two months later, the patient came back, the tumor had grown beneath the fovea, and the beginnings of orange pigment was visible. The most commonly used treatments for choroidal melanoma are ophthalmic plaque brachytherapy and charged particle radiation therapy, typically protons. However, these are very sophisticated techniques and require radiation oncology and medical physics backup. Still widely used around the world, various laser techniques have been employed, both as primary treatment and as adjuvant to radiation. Over the last several years, we saw PDT, or photodynamic therapy, resurface as treatment for small choroidal melanomas. It was originally described in 2005 by Dr. Michael Foster of Germany. Shields and others found that PDT worked best on amelanotic choroidal melanomas. This was the first warning that PDT laser had trouble penetrating the pigment of pigmented tumors. In fact, this is a common theme for all laser treatments for choroidal melanoma. This year, published from Moorfields Eye Hospital, a 38.4% five-year local control rate was seen with PDT as primary therapy for choroidal melanoma. In the past, we saw a meta-analysis which showed a 79.2% local control rate for TTT. This should be compared to plaque therapy, iodine-125, ruthenium, or palladium, where the local control rates range between 93.4 and 96%. So in 2020, we saw laser strike out again. In fact, there exists a graveyard full of peer review papers reporting initial local control and long-term failure of laser therapy for choroidal melanoma. This includes the powerful xenon arc laser used by Meyer Schwickerath, several decades of TTT laser utilizing infrared and a large spot size, and now PDT. The main problem is we know that failure of local control is associated with a 6.3 times increased hazard of metastatic disease. This was proven in the Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force Registry. I think it's time to put the concept of primary laser treatment for choroidal melanoma to rest. So I just presented that lasers have been used in ophthalmic oncology with only minimal success, and time and time again, typically what happens is a new technology is introduced and is tried Years go by, the failures mount, publications are made, and then the technology abandoned. What if there's a better way? Published this month in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, my group has 
introduced a concept of real-world, real-time data for patients, doctors' reported outcomes. Doctors' reported outcomes can serve as an early detection system for substandard treatments. It provides a pulse of the practice, so you can answer those questions. How often does this treatment work? The only way to really know is to start collecting data from every patient that returns to you. But moving forward, it can be done, it can be HIPAA compliant, and it can be helpful. For more information, you may want to read this article. So let's take a look at what a DRO might look like. I have one embedded on my website. That way, patients and doctors can see exactly what our results are. You go to your browser, type in iCancer.com. On the upper right, you'll see Dr. Finger's success rates. Click that hyperlink, and you're brought to this page where visible results are seen. It's a waiting room survey. Every patient returns and has their data anonymously entered and averaged in with the other patients. Here we have choroidal melanoma results. Over the last couple of years, 316 patients were entered. The average vision was 2063. The most common vision was 2025. Local tumor control with plaques was 99.7%, and the eye preservation rate was 96%. It's important to note that the average follow-up was 7.6 years, and this data was last updated on January 7th of 2021. Now, of course, we all know it's a little more complicated than just baseball statistics, and therefore I enclosed uh, explanations of all the data. The next subject is Successful Treatment of Radiation Retinopathy, or I could have titled it Why the Most Common Visual Acuity After Plaque Therapy in My Practice is 2025. Since I first introduced it around 2006, intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy has totally changed my practice. It has a definite role in the prevention and treatment of radiation retinopathy, optic neuropathy, and neovascular glaucoma. Here's a couple of the more recent reprints. My 15-year experience treating patients with radiation maculopathy utilizing anti-VEGF therapy followed a course not uncommon for many new treatments. The first patients were already losing their vision. I found they were stabilized, though they had some damage. The next group of patients had only metamorphopsia and minimal changes, and they, too, were stabilized. However, these two groups already had lost some vision due to the process. In 2020, Dr. Powell and I published an article on early treatment or prophylactic treatment of patients we knew were going to develop radiation maculopathy. This was based on their radiation dose. We compared them to historical controls and found a dramatic result. In this study, there were two groups. One group received periodic intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy starting within six months of their ophthalmic plaque brachytherapy for choroidal melanoma. They were compared to a historical control group selected to match tumor location and have similar dose to fovea. As you see, their visual acuities were comparable. However, their visual acuities at final exam were a mean 2025 in the treated group versus 2160 in the controls. Lastly, we looked at doubling of the visual angle or loss of three or more lines of vision. This was a stark contrast. None of the patients who were treated with anti-VEGF therapy lost three or more lines of vision, whereas 71.4% of the control group did. This and other studies have shown that radiation retinopathy starts at the time of plaque therapy. This study shows that early treatment prevents or delays visually significant radiation retinopathy in high-risk patients. No new complications 
could be related to periodic intravitreal therapy. I would like to disclose that I own USA patent 7,553,486 titled Anti-VEGF Treatment for Radiation-Induced Vasculopathy, for which I receive no royalties. I also own controlling interest in a new medtech startup producing a unique and novel radiation source for ophthalmic brachytherapy. I want to take a moment to thank you for your attention and to thank the Eye Cancer Foundation, who supported much of the research presented in this lecture, and for their committed support for international multicenter cooperation in ophthalmic oncology. Thank you and have a nice day.